Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the fourth edition of annual Les Mustaya Memorial Lecture. Uh, a warm would be odd because uh, with the mercury shooting up so high, I would say a very hearty welcome. I'm Captain Ramachandran, uh, founder of uh, Colors of Glory Foundation. Um, I guess uh, uh, an introduction of that kind is in order because I can find a lot of participants who are first attending an event of ours for the first time. Uh, this uh, Colors of Glory Foundation, our organization, this is the first organization of its kind in India, which is exclusively dedicated to promoting milit uh, awareness of military heritage. Now, um, this annual event is our way of paying homage to a great man whom we are associated with right from the time of our inception. Uh, Mr. Mutaya was, uh, is remembered popularly for his love for everything that was uh, uh, about Madras. I mean, even fondly referred to as uh, Mr. Madras. But uh, his uh, deep admiration for the armed forces is a facet of his personality many are not aware of. In fact, uh, his uh, 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 not having a stint of, uh, not having had a stint of uh, military service was one of the regrets he had had. Nevertheless, extremely well read he was. He, was, uh, his, he, he knew more about battles and uh, wars than many who served in arms. And uh, nevertheless, I mean, when, when we, uh, so we, when we, st this organization, when we sort of planned it, he delightfully accepted our invitation and to join our board of trustees. And he has been our uh, intellectual guide. And we benefited vastly from his immense knowledge and, uh, uh, you know, wisdom while we were establishing ourselves. In fact, uh, his, if you uh, read his book, Born to Dare, on his close friend, Lieutenant General Indoji Singh Gill, um, you'd probably think he was a veteran soldier in the Battle of Monte Cassino in Second World War. That much was his uh, interest in military matters. And um, <clears throat> apart from Mr. Mutaya, we had a, an eminent team of armed forces veterans as our founding uh, trustees, which included uh, Air Marshal Wotherman, uh, Commodore Wasson, and Brigadier Sampat. In recent times, we have added some fresh blood, a uh, young blood rather, <laughs> with uh, Commodore Vijesh Garg and some outstanding civilian talent in Dr. Ramakrishnan Ramani and Mr. Vignesh Raja. So we are growing younger rather than older. Now, <clears throat> having outlined our valuable uh, association with Mr. Mutaya, please permit me to take a few, rob a few minutes of yours uh, to profile our organization briefly. Traditionally, our country never lacked Organization celebrating the heritage of almost every sphere of human, act human activity, be it art, culture, politics, whatever. Our warfare alone does not enjoy this privilege. It is this grave anomaly we set out to rectify when we raised Colors of Glory Foundation some seven years ago. Today, we are proud that we have covered a new niche for ourselves hosting innumerable events, outdoor and indoor, with exhibitions, uh, battle reenactments, commemorative marathons, military uh, uh, intercollegiate, inter-school military cruises, and so on. Even when the COVID-19 put brakes on our uh, activities, we made a virtue out of that setback and conducted a series of uh, uh, virtual events which, which sort of invited participation from all over India and overseas. In fact, our uh, 
Inter all India, intercollegiate college military squeezes have become so popular, we have students from Jammu and uh, Arunachal Pradesh participating. The last two editions consecutively were the top honors went to Delhi and Sonipat colleges. So, so now even after this pandemic has receded, we are so much so, we are, we are continuing with this uh, virtual events. Our website features or 150 popular blogs, and some of them have been published as articles in the uh, United Service Institute Journal, which is the oldest and most prestigious defense obligation in India. We have a pan-Indian membership of both armed force veterans and civilian gentry, and uh, some overseas members as well. Proceed with the main event. Let me give you a glimpse of our, some of our activities in a three-minute video. all of you who are not members of Colors of Glory Foundation to join us in, this, in our unique mission by obtaining a membership. Colonel Sundar and his team outside at the reception desk will help you on this, or uh, you could go to our web website and do it online. I don't want to hold you anymore from our memorial lecture by our distinguished speaker, Dr. Nandita Krishna, which you are eagerly waiting for. Uh, may I now invite uh, Commodore Garg to invite her and escort to the dais. And, uh, Air Marshal Wortherman to formally receive her with a bouquet a day. I now request Air Marshal Wortherman to formally introduce the speaker, please. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, it's my proud privilege and honor uh, to introduce uh, our speaker today. Normally, I do not uh, take a written paper to read, but uh, uh, I have to use, uh, I have to read today with the accomplishments that uh, Mrs. Uh, Nandita Krishna has done. Amazing uh, lady, it's uh, really a privilege uh, to have you here today, ma'am. <clears throat> um, Dr. Nandita Krishna is a versatile personality who has left her imprint in multiple fields. A Chennai-based historian, environmentalist, and author, she holds a PhD in ancient Indian culture from Bombay University and has been a research guide at CPR Institute of Indology, Indolo Indology affiliated to the University of Madras. She is also the founder of CP Art Center, this is her home, CPR Institute of uh, Indological Research, and the CPR Environmental Educational Center in Chennai, as well as the Shakuntala Jagannathan Museum of Kanchipuram, apart from several educational institutions. She is currently the president of the CP Ramaswamy Iyer Foundation. She has been responsible for the revival of Karumba painting, Kota pottery, and traditional drawings and paintings in Mamallapuram, as well as for introducing Tamil folk art forms in schools. Her achievements include the restoration of the Varheshwara temple in Damal and a 450-year-old house in Kanchipuram. Furthermore, she has pioneered in the documentation of India's ecological heritage traditions. She has authored an amazing, amazingly large number of books, 23 in all, on an array of topics varying from Indian art, culture, religion, and environment, to sacred animals of India, sacred trees of India, Hinduism and religion, besides Madras, then Chennai, now, and Madras, Chennai, its history and environment. A tireless worker, she has also produced several research papers and popular articles. Dr. Krishna is a recipient of several awards, including the Devi Award, Nari Shakti Puraskar, Sri Ratna, an Outstanding Woman of Asia, and a uh, Doctorate of Literature from Vidya Sagar University of West Bengal. She has recently been awarded the National Fellowship by the Indian Council of Historical Research. Ma'am, may I now invite you to deliver the talk. Environmentalist in action. <laughs> it was wonderful seeing this picture of Mr. Muttaya, who has been a very old friend, not only of me and my husband, but also of my parents. And uh, I think all of us who have been working for the city really miss him because he was always there. He made it a point to attend every meeting about Madras. I'm going to say Madras, because Mr. Muttaya would, would tell me to, he'd have, if he were here, he'd say, no, not Chennai, say Madras. So uh, he was very particular about it. He was passionate about Madras city. It was, the city was his fascination, obsession, and he loved it more than, I think, he even cared for his own family. He was also the founder of Madras Musings. He organized the annual Madras Day and also the Madras Book Club. And I would really like to thank and congratulate Captain Ramachandran for and Colors of Glory, Colors of Glory Foundation for remembering him every year and making sure all of us don't forget him. Thank you, sir. Colors of Glory Foundation is doing wonderful work, and I know because during the pandemic, when entertainment was uh, very hard to come by, the most entertaining thing was the news and the uh, discussions on television. So you can imagine how bereft we were, but your programs 
which came online were very, very interesting. Thank you very much. I'd like to just mention a few things about Mr. Muteya. I'd like to share something. The very first celebration of Madras Day, was, which was promoted by him, took place in 1989. And everybody, it was at the Taj Koramandal, and everybody was asked to dress up in something in the 70, of the 17th century, because that's when the British came, 1639. So most people came in marsars and nine yards and dhoti and all. I happened to have an old Afghan outfit. I don't know how my family got it, with a full silver front and everything. And I wore it, and it looks, it's completely a Mughal outfit. It's something from Central Asia. But unfortunately, my husband, with his beard, and that time it was black. He came with just a kurta and a churidar and a uh, embroidered cap. He looked more Mughal than I did. <laughs> so that's one thing. But he was very, Mr. Butia was very much against the renaming of Madras and wrote extensively against it. And for those of you here who are Mylaporeans like me, one thing you'd be very happy to know is that Mr. Butia said, if Madras had to be renamed, it should have been Mylapur, because this is the oldest part of the city. And he didn't like Chennai because Chengapa Nayakar never came to Madras, leave alone, live here. And every year, he, he was the one who thought of Madras Day and who started the celebrations. I remember the first time he came to me with Abraham, Irali and Vincent de Souza of uh, the Mylapore Times. And he uh, talked about it and he said, you must do something. So we put up an exhibition with our own uh, uh, catalog, with all our pictures that we had. And every year he'd call up about two, three weeks before and say, just in case I forgot, I think he didn't trust my memory too much and he wasn't wrong. He'd say, now what are you doing this year? So for his sake, I mean, I must tell you, I think all the celebrations, all the exhibitions, the British Library collection, our own archival collection, Mr. Narayan Swami's collection, all these exhibitions that we uh, put up were all really for Mr. Muteya because he made it a point to call and say, what are you doing? So I had to produce something for him. So I think all of us miss him very much, and I'm very happy that we are all celebrating his life and work today in this annual memorial lecture. And I would like to thank Colors of Glory Foundation for honoring me by inviting me to speak on this occasion. Thank you very much, sir. Now may I request you gentlemen to sit there, because I can't talk about architecture without the screen. <laughs> period in India, several new architectural styles were introduced. It was a mixture of various European styles and also included traditional Indian architecture. So it evolved as a kind of Indo-European school of architecture, an architectural heritage, and the main period was between the 18th and the 20th centuries. And one, at one stage it was even known as Indo-Saracenic though that was at a much later stage. Today I shall try to trace the various styles and movements that were to become the new architecture of Madras under the colonial powers. And colonial buildings have varying styles, such as Palladian and so on. Okay, so um, the role of architects and native contractors is noteworthy. Now I'm going to show you a lot of slides I'm not going to describe all of them because then the lecture will go on forever. But I'll just uh, talk generally about a lot of them. So the earliest colonial building surviving in old Madras, now of course Chennai, is the Portuguese church built in 1516. The inscription on the foundation stone further reads that the friars, in honor of their safe, safe arrival in the harbor, built the Church of Our Lady of Light, or Luz Church. The high bell towers and detailed gateway and windows are typical of Portuguese churches 
and are a major theme of Portuguese colonial religious architecture of the 16th century. The style of this church includes Gothic style arch arches, but mainly Baroque, which you can see in the front elevation on Baroque ornamentations which evolved during the period of medieval Christian art in France. Distinct characters of Gothic style are the pointed arches and the ribbed wall, the buttresses, the flying buttresses, large windows which are often grouped and so on. So they have ornate facades which was a European style and which came here with the Portuguese. Of course, this is the entrance to St. Thomas Mount. Very little of the original is there now, and what there is is, of course, so covered by all the new buildings around it. And it's inscribed Madras J. George. So George was the one who did this painting. This was a church built in 1523 by the Portuguese, and the church stands on top of the hill. At the northern foot of the mount is a gateway of four impressive arches, surmounted by a cross bearing the inscribed date 1547. A flight of 160 steps leads up to the summit of the mount. Now, although the Portuguese were the first colonialists to come to Madras, this is all we have left of their architecture. So at least we know that they left something behind. Then, of course, we come to the Dutch. And not many people realize that the Dutch were here before the British. They came to trade, but uh, they also built, again, the Gothic architectural style. In 1613, they established... Okay. They... Uh, built a fort at Saduranga Patnam, also known as Sadras, which was built for commercial purposes, with warehouses, granaries, stables, mansions, and burial grounds inside this fort. But nothing of it remains. I've gone and looked for everything, and nothing is there today. But the fort served as a fortified town. It was right on the beach. If you've been there, you'll know that it's right on the beach. It would have fulfilled their commercial activities there were lots of pirates at this time, so forts were essential to give them protection. And according to the tomb plaques found inside the fort, we can approximately say that it may have been built between 16, 18, and 20. The huge fort walls made of lime mortar and brick were strong enough to face cannon balls. The bastions, ramparts, and watchtowers are found in this fort complex, and that's all that remains of the Dutch fort at Sadras. Now, the Dutch cemetery in Pulikat is what is left of the Pulikat fort. Actually, the Pulikat fort was originally built by the Portuguese, who were displaced by the Dutch. Of course, this is all that remains, the cemetery. And I don't know whether you are aware that between 1621 and 1665, 131 slave ships were deployed by the Dutch to export 38,441 Indians, captured on the Coromandel coast and transported from Pulikat to be sold as slaves in Dutch plantations in Batavia. Batavia is modern Jakarta. So our Indians were taken there to be sold as slaves. Pulikat was, till 1690, the capital of Dutch Coromandel. And it repeatedly changed possession from the Portuguese to the Dutch and so on, till it was finally taken over by the British. Then we come, of course, to the British, although the Portuguese and Dutch evolved colonial architecture in India, no major civil constructions came up in what is today's Madras. It was just these port, this fort on the port. Madras is really an early settlement of the British in India, with numerous colonial buildings built over the centuries. Now, the first construction of, Madras, of the British in Madras was the factory 
as they called what was to become Fort St. George. It was on a piece of land they negotiated for the purpose of trade from the Raja of Chandragiri by Francis Day, and this was on August 22nd, 1639, which is why we celebrate the day as Madras Day. Um, the construction of the port was started in 1640, so it was soon after the British came. Initially, the British constructed a warehouse with accommodation facilities, and later they fortified their township. The port was completed in 1644, coinciding with St. George's Day, which is why it became Fort St. George. A local settlement also emerged near the fort, consisting of local merchants and laborers. So this is Fort St. George on the Coromandel Close Coast. I got this painting from the British Library for my book, uh, Madras Then Chennai Now. And uh, the pay artist is Jan van Rijn, a Dutchman working in London. Also visible now, this is really more a conjecture of what Madras, the fort, would have been like. Also visible are St. Thomas. St. Thomas uh, Mount you cannot see from the fort, but he's put in everything. St. Mary's Church, the government house, other. He's packed them all into this building. Now inside Fort St. George, this is a watercolor by James Hunter. At the side, I've given the owners, name of the owners of these paintings. And the early buildings inside the fort were Georgian and constructed sometime after the plans of Benjamin Robbins, who was the man who reinforced the fort with walls and bastions so that it could withstand attack. And that was necessary because, as you know, the French and the British were constantly at war in this area. The beautiful Georgian buildings within the fort came up in the 1770s and 80s as part of a rebuilding program, along with Robin's improvements. Many of the buildings inside the King's Barracks still stand and are excellent examples of Indo-European workmanship and material. Now, you'll find one thing interesting, that they all are flat-roofed, because at this time, the Indians built a sloping roof, a roofed, uh, you know, houses. But you'll find these are all flat roof. This is the original government house inside the fort. And the early buildings have a combination of Indian and European style with Palladian style, style facades. Palladian style is a kind of triangle with uh, pillars looking very imposing, Roman, Greek. And uh, that was a very popular style. They had pillar verandas, Indian style large windows, Romanesque frontages. But the traditional Tamilian houses continued to exist outside the fort in what was known as Black Town. And this was White Town. Very, uh, I mean, the name says it all. Now, the flat ceiling, there's a lot of uh, controversy because the British engineers claimed to have invented the Madras Terrace. But I do not agree with this because our museum in Kanchipuram, which is over 400 years old, nearly 450, we have a Madras terrace over there. And that was long before the British came to India. So I definitely would say that the Madras terrace is Indian. It's a traditional ceiling technique used for small spans, made of wood and archical or kandikal, which is a small brick. Thick teak wood beams were placed on the wall, which supported wooden rafters that, ra that ran along the shorter side of the room. In fact, our old building over here, the main building, has uh, um, a Madras terraces all over. The gaps between the rafters were filled with kandikal bricks, and they were laid across in a diagonal fashion stuck together with lime paste to create a sheet of bricks over the frame of rafters. A three-layer diagonal brick course was laid with each layer 
in an alternate direction. So you can see the tremendous science that went into it. You know, instead of my just reading it out, uh, you can imagine, because this was a time when you didn't have RCC, and the Indian craftsmen, the Indian uh, contractor, and uh, the men who were building it really put their mind and created this Madras Terrace. So you can see Clive House, which is there now still, in the fort. It has a Kandikal roof, Fort Museum, Fort Exchange. Later became the Bank of Madras. Now it's the Fort Museum. And the interior of Fort St. George, North Street. This is all White Town. You can see it's quite distinct from Black Town. Now slowly, this is Fort Square. And St. Mary's Church. It's worth describing St. Mary's Church because it was the only bomb-proof building in the fort. On account of a bomb-proof roof that was approximately four feet thick and rounded in the manner of a wagon's roof. So if you go there, you'll find that it's a rounded roof. So as to call cannonballs to ricochet. The internal dimensions of the building are 86 feet by 56 feet, and the outside walls are four feet thick, can you imagine? practically half the width of this. And uh, the walls separating the nave from the aisles are, are three feet thick. So the extraordinary thickness of the walls was to protect the building from attack and damage during storms. This was a big problem, and this is what also destroyed the environment of Madras. Because the British, in order to see the French troops coming in, they completely cut down all the trees between Fort St. George and Mylapore, so that the French could not uh, hide behind the tree. N normally, the soldiers, I suppose, in those days, hid behind the tree and slowly came up by cutting down all the trees. So, you know, the uh, deforestation, the environmental degradation really began in these uh, British-French wars. So this is... Uh, also from the McNab collection. It was the residence for the governors of Madras before what is now Raj Bhavan was built. Now here, you see that this is a European house, but this comes into Black Town. Slowly, the Europeans moved out of White Town, out of the fort, and started living in Black Town, and they started building houses and here you see a street where one side is Indian and one side is British. So I think this tells you a lot about racial discrimination. Whatever they may say about not having it, this is definitely there. Now, were there castles in Madras? There were. And this painting from the British Library describes the ca ca castlets in Madras two neo-Gothic castellated houses with a third house in the center in the background. The house was built by James Brodie, an East India Company servant who was granted 11 acres of land, just a small employee, on Quibble Island in the estuary of the Adya River, again destroying our environment. Brodie's castle was an imposing structure flanked by these castellated turrets set on either side of the main house. So you actually had castles in Madras. Brody's Castle, Fort St. George, Assembly build, Building. This also had that castle, castle effect. Then, of course, we come to, this is a very important architectural style, a Palladian style. Palladian architecture is a European style derived from and inspired by the designs of the Venetian architect Andrea Palladio, who lived between 1508 and 1580. Palladio's work was strongly based on the symmetry, perspective, and values of the formal classical temple architecture of the ancient Greeks and Romans, such as the Temple of Zeus in Olympia, Greece and the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus in Rome. From the 17th century, 
Palladio's interpretation was adapted into a style known as Palladianism, and it continued to develop until the end of the 18th century. So this is a Palladian style house in Madras. And you'll find that most of the houses are Palladian, at least all the government, this thing you'll find, they have this big triangle with pillars in front, very imposing, very Romanesque. This was government house. It was the home of successive governors. It was purchased by the East India Company from a Portuguese lady, Mrs. Antonia de Madeiros. And one of the theories for the name of Madras is that it comes from this lady, the Madra, Madeira's family. But I don't agree because the original uh, document which the British signed, with, uh, which Francis Day signed with uh, Venkatapati Nayakar, says the land south of the village of Madrasa Pattinam. So Madrasa Pattinam is actually the original village which was north of the Fort St. George. So I don't agree with this theory, but I may as well share it with you. And this is what is today Rajaji Hall. So this is also part of that typical Palladian architecture. This was the original club, Madras Club. We have the former president sitting here, mm -hmm. Mr. Nagarajan, Madras Club, which was uh, first situated off Mount Road between White's Road and General Patters Road on property that was bought from for 30,000 rupees. And later it became the Indian Express estate. And then it was pulled down, and today it's Express Avenue shopping mall. So St. George's Cathedral, isn't it beautiful? Can you imagine Cathedral Road like this? It, and it has carriages arriving at the door. This was a site known called the Chowtri Plain, which is now Cathedral Road. And it was designed by Colonel Caldwell, a senior engineer of the British East India Company. And it occupies an important place in the history of Christianity in India, as the Church of South India was inaugurated here in 1947, after the British left. St. Andrew's Kirk was a Scottish equivalent. And although the uh, English and the Scots lived together, worked together, they led separate lives. They did not, they had their own churches and one would not attend the church of the other. So this is in the interior of St. Andrew's Church. It's worth going and seeing. It's a very beautiful building. Then we come, of course, to Indo Saraceni. It's a synthesis of Hindu, Muslim, Gothic, revival styles using Indian materials but developed by British architects in India during the late 19th and early 20th century. So it combines Gothic gothic arches, domes, spires. You've all seen it. You know what it is. Chepok Palace, designed by Paul Benfield, is said to be the first Indo-Saracenic building in India. Now, is, was the Indo-Saracenic style a conscious attempt by the British to show that they belonged to the country? I wonder. <coughs> Any case, this is the first Indo-Saracenic building of Madras. The whole Indo-Saracenic style, remember, started in Madras. Today you see it all over the country, but Madras was its birthplace. It's the official residence of the Nawab of our court. This is the Kalas Mahal and the Humayun Mahal, which was designed by Paul Benfield in 1768. These are the architects, the Indo-Saracenic architects, Robert Fellows Chisholm, Henry Irwin, Charles Mant, William Emerson, George Whitted, Frederick Stevens. And you have these onion, onion domes, the miniature domes, the dome chhatris. So what are the typical signs of Indo-Saracenic art? Overhanging architecture, sorry, overhanging eaves, pointed cusp or scallop arches, pinnacles, towers, minarets, even harem windows, <laughs> pavilions, open pavilions with bangla roofs. 
pierced open arcades, vaulted roofs, Madras terrace ceilings. All of them have Madras terrace ceilings. And then you have walls of relief plaster. Some were decorative and painted. And if you go to a place like uh, the Chepok Palace, you will see a lot of plaster work on the walls. Stained glass windows, stone flooring, arcaded verandas. All this was typical. The construction material, red brick painted with lime mortar. So this was the uh, Indo-Saracenic architecture, which is really a legacy of the Indo-British combination, which, we, which is left to us. Connemara Library. This is a very beautiful building. And if you have not been there, please go in and see it. Madras Central Station, very typically Indo-Saracenic. Then this is the Presidency College. Actually, this is a plain view, plano, but uh, of course, flat. The Bharat Insurance Building on Mount Road. You must have seen this. Mr. Muttaya worked very hard to prevent it from being pulled down. Senate House, Madras High Court, Moor Market. That's when I first met Mr. Mutea, we fought and we really fought for Moor Market and then it was very conveniently it burnt down. A lot of convenient things happened in Madras also. Spencer's. I think most of us, if you belong to Madras, my happiest memories of my childhood were being taken by my grandfather in the evening, eating cake at Spencer's and it was it was it was really another world. Then of course Ice House, that's also got in Indo-Saracenic. Then the another final style is Art Deco, Deco, which first appeared in France after the First World War and became popular in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. It's a very eclectic style that combines traditional motifs with modern imagery and material. It looked very modern. It has rich colors geometrical shapes and ornamentation. And many buildings were built like this. There are no external verandas, and it incorporated new technologies, such as the lift, the elevator. Cantilever, cantilever came in for the first time in Art Deco, and it had motives which were used in grills. Previously, grills were just straight, uh, parallel jail bars. Now they had elaborate motives and parapet walls along with vertical windows. And it was described in assertive, as an assertively modern style that ran to symmetry rather than asymmetry and to the rectilinear rather than the curvilinear. Till now, till Indo-Saracenic, they were all very curvilinear. Now they are very rectilinear. It responded to the demands of the machine and of new materials and the requirement of mass production. In fact, a lot of multi-story buildings came up in this time. So you have Higginbotham, which is an art decor building, Dare House, Parry and Company, Mint Clock Tower, Das Prakash Hotel, another which has gone, the best Masal Dosha in Madras, Casino Theatre, also gone, yes. And finally, we come to bungalows of Madras, which are developed from the Bengali Bangla. And the English adapted it to their needs by designing it with wide covered verandas, an open floor plan. I mean, think of your uh, village houses. That is a typical Indian house, you know, which is closed. But now it was open, and it was a uh, lot of, there was a lot of cross ventilation and protection from the hot, dusty Indian climate, but it also incorporated things like the Nadu Mittam and some uh, th uh, different Indian systems. It had a low-pitched roof, and the entry generally opens directly into the living room. Now, that was never done in a traditional Indian house. You always had a thin eye, and you went in, and, but here you went straight into the living room. A large front porch, 
then which became an outdoor covered space and there were a lot of verandas porches and patios which gave a lot of um, what shall i call it a lot of air came in cross ventilation and so on and movement came in from room to room the passage which is typical of uh, south indian homes was eliminated so here you have madras club but it was actually the home of george mowbray in the 18th century these are all sketches from kalamkriya ben's garden marble hall in luz beach house of mr subramanian here harati lem this is our own building over here anyone who is interested please come and see it the cp ramaswamy ayer foundation and uh, sorry i'll just uh, no no i'm going the wrong way okay bharati illam has although it is a bangla it also has a lot of the traditional indian motifs remaining and uh, Mithila also you can see is more indian in appearance although it is a bungalow so colonial architecture was a synthesis and confluence of styles which gave new dimensions to the planning of building the size of the rooms increased substantially and i think all of you would have noticed that in many of the homes of madras indian rooms were much smaller than their european counterparts new concepts of dining rooms ball rooms etc were a colonial influence the bungalows became english country houses adapted to the indian climate the building shows separation of spaces such as the gates and barriers which in a traditional house was part of the main building the approach height and size were expressions of colonial power you know one thing about these bungalows where these Englishmen lived. They also wanted to show that you know we are the ruling power. They were making a statement. You know, it wasn't just one more house. So the, this building, I think, originally belonged to Justice Morton, not at our uh, foundation building. So you know, they all built it in that uh, with that idea. And of course, the planning took into account the climate. The walls were thick, and almost all the buildings. have a veranda the last is actually chettinad palace it's one of the few chettinad few palaces built outside chettinad and it was built between 1902 and 12 it's an exquisite construction of italian marble limestone and teak but it's really a one off thing you don't have anything like this before or after So ladies and gentlemen is this the end of Madras's heritage buildings if you drive down CP Rabaswami Iyer road or TTK road you'll find buildings broken down every day many of these buildings have already been demolished or conveniently burnt unfortunately there is no heritage act that will protect heritage buildings in Tamil Nadu Bombay Goa many cities have it we tried very hard mr mutayya really worked for a heritage act but you know the city fathers were definitely against it so what is the future for madras's unique and eclectic architecture god knows i'd like to thank dr balaji he is here assistant professor at the cpr institute of indological research mr v narayan swami who has a fabulous collection of paintings of old madras this is chandra shankar who published kalam kriya the british library where i collected a lot of paintings the hindu roli books and of course good old wikipedia who <laughs> always has enough pictures which we can take i'd like to thank colors of glory again for giving me this opportunity thank you very much May I now invite um, Commodore uh, Vijay Garg to propose a word of thanks.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I consider it a privilege and honor to be proposing a vote of thanks after such a lovely talk. Well, Dr. Krishna took us to a journey of Madras from 1915-16. It's a generation like me and sitting behind youngsters with thinking, was Madras like this? And the slides and the picture was so catching up. You can imagine, just could have been there, if you go to Fort St. George and you climb up on the track, it gives the same feeling today also. So he brought us how the Portuguese came, then the Dutch came and the British came, and how the Fort St. George, the four inch thick wall, I can support you on the statement because I had an office there for four years. No wall on any building is less than two, two feet at least, and you can't renovate them today. You can only paint them, that's all. This, uh, this one part. Well, ma'am, you said uh, the Madras the celebration, yes. I think it is one event, people come, and you very nicely said, the gentle husband can throw surprise any time, as you mentioned here. So people do come in this event, I saw it when I joined, came to Chennai, and it is the one event of pride for anybody in Chennai, Madras, to be part of celebration. The best part I like uh, in this talk for all of us, that you're relating and we were going down the memory lane. What was and what is there, like Spencer's. You have been, you have been here that time and we saw today's building. You correlate and you can say, oh, this is gone. There are some buildings here, like your uh, like Moor uh, Museum is there. Fort St. George is there. I've been on the building for four years. You feel sometimes why nobody is looking after them. The heritage part, yes, can be done. Well, Madras Club, I'm very happy that the chairman is here. And of course, the last to finish is the Das Prakash, the dosas. With Chennai dosas, you go to Delhi, this is, you don't ask you, Chennai, how the do Chennai dosa is very good, very nice, connected from building to food. It's a very fascinating talk to talk to Nanda Krishna have. I have no much words, but I'll say big words for everybody to thank you. This is a fascinating talk, supporting with your slides, and making us connect with the architecture, the, the history, as well as some links, why Madras Day is so and so day, probably I didn't know about it, and you linked it so well. Thank you so much. I may request uh, Captain Ramchandra to give a small uh, token of the colors of glory to Dr. Narita Krishna. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank all the distinguished guests who are present here, veterans of ranging from 1962 to 71 until today, and of course fathers of many young, young soldiers sitting here. Thank you so much for gracing this evening and being part of this uh, uh, talk, the fourth edition of Mr. Butaya's memorial, and we are part of Armed Forces Veteran Officers Association, we call it short AFPOA, the acronym. I'll also like to thank all the guests in the audience who are attending about it for the first time. Very thankful to you for sparing your time. And we'll also feel so happy that you're joining us as member. We'll have much more talk like this, like Dr. Krishna gave us today. Connect back to our heritage, which is military heritage, the civil heritage go together in nation. A good, a good point. I also like to thank the member of Madras uh, Book Club and the Madras Literary Society who are attending us today first time. And we'd like you to see join much more to us on our events. In our, we have be happy. I will feeling my duty. I don't uh, thank Colonel Sundar and uh, his good lady who has always been uh, taking, uh, shouldering the responsibilities. Thank you so much. And I will be forgetting if I don't thank young Danish, who is hiding, yeah, and his friends from Gurunar College who are doing a volunteer's job. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I will be also very failing if I don't thank Mr. Srinivasan and his team from the center who made us this hall available and all the support. Thank you so much. And last but not the least, 
the team of the studio who are giving the photograph and video coverage to us. Thank you so much so that we look back, not only the slides, who all were there, joined us today, and many more come next time. Thank you so much. At the end, I'll thank all of you once again. You spared your evening, came here. We met, yes, but what a fascinating talk we get to listen and learn from here. Thank you so much, all of you. Jai Hind. May I request all of you to just rise for the national anthem? Janaganaman Adinayak Jayahe Bharat Bhagya Vidata Punjab Sindhu Gujarat Marata Dravida Utkala Vanga Vindya Himachal Yamuna Ganga Uchala Jaladita Ranga तब शुभ नामे जागे तब शुभ आशीष मागे गाये दब जय गाता जन घन मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विदाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे